he has to, in a certain way, lose his identity as the person who finds the one and brings out all that stuff, and has to go into this place of the totally the unknown, where he has no idea now what's going to happen, because what he thought was going to happen is not necessarily going to happen anymore. It's up for grabs, so to speak. But in fact, it all happens the way that it's supposed to, right? So, yeah. Uh, William and Alex. Um, since the Matrix is kind of an astral, astral spiritual world, and how come dreams and nightmares don't have any sway or effect upon it? Well, that's interesting. You know, we... I don't know if any of you have seen the Animatrix. Yeah, the hardcore, right? So there's a, prequel, there's a prequel to the Matrix in the form of little vignettes done by different uh, artists that the Wachowski brothers were enamored of. Um, and he basically let them illustrate it according to it, but they wrote the, the central storylines. And you have a little bit of discussion in, in some of those about, about that aspect with the kid in particular. The kid actually shows up and reloaded. This kid is like following me around and, and is moving around, the, you know, loading up the guys. He's from the Animatrix. So yeah, there is, there is that aspect. And there is, you know, the, the one about the runner, I think it's called World Record. Um, that addresses the same, same thing. So I haven't seen it. Uh, this trilogy has um, um, really inspired you. Um, my question is, it obviously has inspired many people to think about it. Uh, is this particular, these movies, um, have uh, they, um, are there any other movies that have um, inspired people to write and think about it so much? And do you think this is the one that continues to... Um, and make people think about it and delve into it in, in different aspects? Well, I think there is something unique about this trilogy. Um, there are certainly many, many movies which have architects behind them which are addressing the same thing from different angles. But in this trilogy, one, it's accessible to anybody if you're just sort of grow up in America or not in America as just sort of a modern person. Uh, just just because of the way it's produced, the visual elements, the, all of that stuff, which is sort of, it tests well, right? So there's, people see it. But then when they see it, there's more there than they may have thought. And they may recognize that, and it may inspire them to start thinking about it. So after the first Matrix was released, you get a flurry of activity, um, a lot of it from young people, dealing with the issues, primarily the ones that were sort of obvious on a philosophical level. But the reason why they dealt with that, because that's the thinking element, but it was the feeling element that really speaks to them. Because Neo goes through stuff in these movies, and if what I'm saying has any validity to it, it's, it's going through the archetypes of human transformation in a, in a really cosmically significant way. And that's not something that you may be totally conscious of when you see it, but which still is present through just taking in the, the experience. So for me, there's something significant about this and the way that it lays itself out. And, and I, I mean, it can be argued, I suppose, you could try and argue, you know, reversing some of these, like maybe the first one is the willing. It's, you can argue all those things, and that's totally fine. Um, for me, this seems the most coherent way to, to present it, and it follows the archetypes from multiple directions through simultaneously. So I think it really works on, on many, many levels. And I'm just trying to, you know, a lot of people talk about the philosophy. Some people talk about the spirituality, but the way that they do so is like the way that they do popcorn philosophy, which is they take an issue out of the movies and they set it over here into their context and speak about it only from this context. They don't then relate it back to the movie. What I try to do is reading it like a dream you can't just take the dream figure out and say, oh yeah, my sister showed it in my dream. You have to go back to that figure and connect it back to yourself, to the rest of the dream. You have to have the, the whole thing has to work coherently. And so I, for myself, trying to deal with this, the test was, for example, if, if these archetypes work out, then they have to manifest in certain ways. Smith has to multiply himself, in a way, as an archetype of what the Lucifer being will do when given the opportunity to expand, to copy, to be his own sort of virus, and so forth. So for me, the aspect was, does it go back to the movie, and the movie continues to elaborate on the same theme, with the same archetypes, 
that was that was showed me that there's something significant. So the other people who asked me with the spirituality don't relate it back to the movie. Yeah. Uh, do you um, see a parallel between? The mirror in the first movie that engulfs Anderson um, and transforms him into the, and, and then into the, which is like a reflection of light, and then the in the last movie the, the reflection of darkness that engulfs him. Yes, absolutely. It's very keen to be able to notice that difference. In the first one, when Neo is being taken out of the Matrix for the first time, he's he actually touches a mirror. It comes off on him and replicates. They're talking about this, and actually engulfs him and goes down his throat. Right. And that's, that was very dangerous. So what that is, is actually representing a certain way the temptation of the Luciferic being, which one is exposed to in moments through which, if you look at this from the perspective of spiritual transformation, this is very much like what the old initiates would go through when they had their initiation. So the initiation was, so you're surrounded by these people who are the higher fans, or the people who are responsible for putting you into a strange state so that you could have certain experiences but then bringing you back. And that was the role of all those people standing around at the time. And the temptation is that you're, you're met with a mirror image of yourself. And what you see in that mirror image is in a certain way all of the stuff that you thought was on the inside now is on the outside. And now you're being met with things that you thought were secrets approaching you in the form of conversations, meetings with people, things that happened to you for seemingly no apparent reason, and you realize that they're all connected to what was happening on the inside because you've inverted your consciousness to be on the outside now. And so you're meeting yourself. You're, meet, you're seeing yourself. You're, you're a mirror to yourself. And everything is reflected back to you. But it's coming from you. And that's the dilemma of that first initiation. It's in alchemy, it would be called calcination. And you're burning in your own stuff that you carry with you as default attitudes, behaviors, and thoughts about the world. And all of that gets tested, is what Neo works through to be transformed thinking in the first movie. So maybe, probably times, maybe the last couple questions. Uh, you and then you. One other thing about the question of God, if, if, or I wonder if you think that um, this is not only a transformation of the human, but also a transformation of God into that God is actually becoming consciousness. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, We could definitely talk about it in that way. And I think there is a, I mean, really the, the element of what's happening with sort of Neo's double in the figure of Smith is very key for how that's playing out as sort of a parallel path of transformation that Smith goes through. And it's always being done to him in a way. And the reason why is that each stage he's representing what the, the polar aspect of the archetype. The, the regressive form that could be manifested. If things, if Neo didn't do what he ends up doing, then it would go that way. Because Neo and Smith are, in a certain way, kind of one being, too. Yeah, Ethan? That's not a very good ending question. <laughs> Does anyone have a good ending question? <laughs> Well, this is, this is the, the expression of what the Luciferic impulse does in humans. We want to be totally unbounded. And Neo is at the point of falling prey to that temptation at the end of the first movie when he says on the phone to the computer world, I'm going to show you a new world, right? A world without borders and without boundaries. So he's, he's thinking of this freedom, and that's the right thing to be thinking of. But if the question is, how is he going to manifest that freedom? Is he going to do it by trying to destroy Agent Smith? That's not going to work, right? He's got to do something else. So, yes, it's about freedom, but Lucifer, the Smith being, is showing how that freedom can be taken to an extreme in a way that will be regressive. And that's what his path is through all through all families. All right, so we're at 9.30 around the back, so thank you very much. Thank you.
Thanks again for coming out.